Organization, preparation, small maneuvering, and still no major battle or bloodshed after nearly four weeks of recognized conflict. I'm Brendan Forrest. This is Civil War. The last few weeks saw hurried preparations as thousands flocked to the colors on each side to participate in what many believed would be a quick war. Each belligerent's president made questionable moves. Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus, allowing citizens to be jailed indefinitely without any trial to occur. Davis took the war to the high seas, distributing letters of mark, employing privateers to hunt down American merchant vessels. Let's look at the next two weeks. May 10th, 1861. Citizens and soldiers clashed during riots in St. Louis. Captain Nathaniel Lyon, temporarily in command of the arsenal there, assembled a group of pro-unionists. The pro-secession leading state militia was camped just outside the city at the direction given by Missouri's pro-Southern governor, Claiborne Fox Jackson. Lyon and possibly up to 7,000 men surrounded the militia camp of roughly 700 men. The commander of the state militia, D.M. Frost, surrendered the camp without firing a shot. While being transferred to the arsenal under guard, shots rang out and in the end, 28 or 29 individuals died. Mobs rioted in the streets all night as a result. A side note here, within the crowd of onlookers was none other than William Tecumseh Sherman and his son. Elsewhere on the 10th, Maryland's legislature passed a resolution imploring President Abraham Lincoln to cease prosecuting the war against the South. Also on this day, Confederate President Davis signed an act of Congress calling for the purchase of six warships arms, and stores. Confederate Secretary of the Navy, Stephen Mallory, urged the building of ironclads due to the inequality of the Confederate Navy. The government in Montgomery, the current capital of the CSA, placed Robert E. Lee in command of all Confederate troops in Virginia. On the 11th in San Francisco, business was suspended, flags waved, and people crowded the streets for a patriotic pro-union demonstration of the speeches and processions. Though there were strong pockets of pro-secessionists in California, along with those who favored neutrality and even an independent Republic of the Pacific, California would ultimately remain in the Union. Likewise, a pro-Union gathering was called at Wheeling in West Virginia. On the 13th, Queen Victoria of Britain officially issued a proclamation declaring, Whereas hostilities have unhappily commenced between the government of the United States of America and certain states styling themselves the Confederate States of America, and whereas we, being at peace with the government of the United States, have declared our royal determination to maintain a strict and impartial neutrality in the contest between the said contending parties. Britain determined to maintain a strict neutrality between contending parties in America and to accord to both sides the rights of belligerence. The Queen warned British citizens against assisting either side. U.S. Minister to Great Britain, Charles Francis Adams, arrived that evening to learn the news. He was sent to prevent the recognition of the South as a belligerent. The recognition of the Confederacy as a belligerent, although not as desirable as being recognized as a country, provided a number of international rights to the Confederacy, including the ability to have their agents contract purchases of necessary arms and supplies. The South will continue its efforts to gain national recognition from European nations, but the strategy they implement will fail to gain the desired results. No nation will ever recognize the Confederate States of America as an independent nation. On the 14th of May in Harpers Ferry, Colonel Thomas Jackson decreed trains traveling through the city would not be allowed to travel at night. Through his trickery, he was able to confiscate numerous trains and cars which previously had been operating between Virginia, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. These trains were operating in hopes of not isolating the Marylanders. Also on the 14th, William Tecumseh Sherman returned to the Army, accepting a commission as a commander of the newly formed 13th Infantry Regiment of Regulars. On May 15th, General Joseph E. Johnston, after accepting a Brigadier General Commission the day before, was named to command troops near Harpers Ferry, replacing Colonel Thomas Jackson. Off in New Orleans, the Confederate privateer Calhoun, under the command of Captain John Wilson, captured the bark Ocean Eagle from Maine. In Baltimore, Brigadier General George Cadwalder was named to replace General Butler. Butler was sent to Fort Monroe, which guarded the approaches to the James River via the Chesapeake. Also on the 15th, the USS Bainbridge was ordered to sail to the Gulf of Mexico and eastern coast of Central America to protect steamers hauling California gold between San Francisco and New York. The gold would leave California, travel down the Pacific coast of Panama, be loaded onto train cars, hauled through the jungle, and be reloaded on steamers in the Caribbean Sea. Southern privateers sought these ships as the gold was desperately needed for their war effort. 
Over the course of the next year, the Bainbridge would capture two schooners and assist in the taking of one steamer. On the 16th, Tennessee Governor Isham Harris finally achieved his purpose of gaining Tennessee admission to the Confederacy. This action would be reaffirmed on June 8th through a statewide referendum. President Davis signed a bill authorizing a loan to the Confederacy of $50 million and the issuance of Treasury notes on the 17th. He also signed a bill admitting North Carolina to the Confederacy contingent upon approval of the Ordinance of Secession and ratification of the Constitution. California pledged support to the Union and Chief John Ross proclaimed the neutrality of the Cherokees in the Indian Territory. On the 18th, Southern Flag Officer French Forrest was contracted to salvage the wreck of the USS Merrimack. It would take the next two weeks to bring her up. May 18 and 19, the Battle of Sewell's Point near Hampton Road, Virginia. This was another very small engagement involving two Union gunboats under the command of Lieutenant D.L. Brain. The boats fired upon rebel-held positions in Norfolk Bay in an effort to reinforce the blockade of Hampton Roads. Little damage was done, and only 10 casualties were sustained. Low casualty engagements will continue throughout the rest of the year. On Monday, the 20th, U.S. Marshals raided telegraph offices throughout the North and confiscated all telegram files sent during the past calendar year. They hoped these files would reveal spy sources and personnel. In some cases, this was successful. Also on the 20th, North Carolina becomes the 11th and last state to secede from the Union. A 100-gun salute was fired in the state capital of Raleigh when secession was announced. Questioning the extent of the state's participation in the Civil War, North Carolina reacted hostily to Abraham Lincoln's plan to reunite the country by force. After Lincoln's general call for troops, the majority of North Carolina's former Unionists became secessionists, and radicals overnight. North Carolina may have been the last to leave the Union, but she furnished more troops and suffered more casualties than any other southern state, including Virginia. Throughout the war, the state of North Carolina will furnish more than 125,000 men to fight in the Confederacy. Virginia claims to have fielded 155,000, but over 30,000 of these men came from other states, such as Maryland. That same day, the state of Kentucky declared its neutrality and forbade the movement of any troops on state soil. Restricting troop movement within state borders would prove impossible. Both sides would eventually violate this decree. On the 20th, the Provisional Congress of the Confederacy voted to move the capital of the nation from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. The move was to ensure the support of Virginia as the most populous and greatest industrial producer of the newly formed nation. On Tuesday the 21st, Lincoln sent a dispatch to American Ambassador to Great Britain, Charles Francis Adams, who had arrived in Great Britain the week prior. He was instructed to desist from contact with the British government as long as they continued intercourse with the domestic enemies of this country. In the South, President Davis signed a bill outlawing the payment by Southerners of money due to Northern merchants and approved another bill prohibiting the cotton trade through any port save Confederate ones. On this day as well, the oldest active Federal warship, the USS Constellation, veteran of the War of 1812, captured a slave ship off the mouth of the Congo. May 23rd, citizens from Virginia voted three to one in favor of secession in the eastern and central parts of the state. There was great pro-Union sediment in the mountains to the west. On the 24th, General Benjamin Butler refused to release three slaves who had come into his lines. He held them as contraband, causing the beginnings of an issue of what to do with captured and runaway slaves. Also on the 24th, federal troops entered Virginia taking Alexandria. The small Confederate detachment in the city left quickly and retreated in good order. Few shots were fired, but Colonel Elmer Ellsworth, good friend of the president, was fatally shot by hotel owner James Jackson as he entered the establishment to take down the secessionist flag flying from the building. In this loss, Ellsworth became a martyr for the federal cause. His funeral was held in the East Room of the White House the next day. Lincoln's letter to Ellsworth's parents stated the following. In the untimely loss of your noble son, our affliction here is scarcely less than your own. So much of promised usefulness to one's country and of bright hopes for oneself and friends have rarely been so suddenly dashed as in his fall. In size, in years, and in youthful appearance, a boy only, his power to command men was surpassingly great. This power combined with a fine intellect, an indomitable energy, and a taste altogether military constituted in him, as seemed to me the best natural talent in that department I ever knew. Such sorrow and loss of talent is sadly just beginning. 
And there you have it. Two more weeks down and still no major engagements. At this point, both sides are jockeying for position and preparing for war, with a new potential player, the British, being introduced. This relative peace will be short-lived, as our first major engagement will soon be upon us. But that is for another time. This is Civil War.